Welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Hi, I'm Charles Hatley from Malone Hatley PC, and I want to welcome you back to part two of our equal distribution conversation. What we were talking about last time was dividing debt and equitable distribution, and Dan really gave us a lot of insight on dividing debt and what to start looking for in discovery. And so, Rebecca, what do you do when you're talking about dividing debt and really explaining to a client, like, hey, you might have to take on some of this debt? Right. So that that's a difficult conversation either way, whether it's assets or whether it's debts, because there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of misunderstanding out there that, oh, well, if it's in my name, it's mine. And if it's in their name, it's theirs. And that's just not the way the majority of, of states work. So in Virginia, even though we're not a, um, you know, a, a common property state or anything like that, whatever happens during the marriage is presumed to be marital. And it's up to you to, to try and drag something back out um, and prove that it was not marital in some way or another. And that's few and far between. Mm -hmm. So in general, on the day you get married, if you go and spend money on a credit card, if you go take out a student loan, if you take out you know a HELOC on your house, if you're anything, any of those kinds of transactions, those are all marital. And so if your spouse is a spender, and they take out lots of credit cards and they go run up all the credit cards all the time, you might think, oh, well, that's that's their problem. Mm -hmm. And really it isn't. So in the eyes of the law, it's you're on the hook for that debt as well. And when it comes time for the divorce, if you have one spouse sitting over here with you know $100,000 in debt and the other spouse is sitting there with $100,000 in savings, you're gonna be splitting that both ways. Um, and that's unfortunate in, in a lot of situations. So I did have a client that um, his wife was a big spender and she really liked to go out and use her credit cards and go shopping and, you know, bought herself all kinds of stuff. And he was he was just beside himself because part of the reason for the divorce was they couldn't get on the same page financially. And he was like, I have to pay off her credit cards again. <laughs> like, I've already been doing that. This is the whole problem is I don't want to pay off her credit cards anymore. It's like, yeah, but one more time. Right. And then. <laughs> And then no more in the future. Um, but but it works both ways. And a lot of the time you don't realize that if you're going back to school and applying for a student loan, um, this is now going to be part of your spouse's responsibility too. Um, you know, one really easy and great way to stay out of those types of situations is to have a prenuptial agreement. Because if you have a prenuptial agreement in place, then it is true that anything in my name is mine, anything in their name is theirs. Um, but absent that agreement, the presumption goes completely the other direction. Let me ask you this, Rebecca. How does the court handle IRS debt? So let's say uh, you have a, a couple that are both W-2 employees. One mm -hmm. person is paying their taxes as they should, and the other person has you know, declared all sorts of deductions and they're paying zero dollars in taxes and now they have a huge tax debt. How would the court handle that? So again, the presumption is going to be that it's marital um, in in like true tax, like tax evasion situations. You can apply for innocent spouse relief from the IRS. Um, and if you're able to qualify under the requirements of the IRS, then that's something that the court would definitely consider. Um, and so there may be, you know, some sort of penalty imposed on the spouse that incurred all of that debt without the knowledge or participation of the other spouse. Um, but if you don't have, if you can't meet that burden with the IRS, the court's going to say, nope, you're on the hook for it as well. And even if the IRS is only able to, you know, collect up after the other spouse, um, then they can still turn around and get reimbursement from you. You're technically on the hook under the divorce order as well, if the court says so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, IRS is, is a scary, scary animal. Uh, Dan, last time you brought up uh, debts between family members, you know, where, where one family member will loan another family member money. How do you handle that? 
It, it depends on what side, right? Because it's delicate. If it's my client, we want to have open and honest discussions as far as what was that money used for? Has this happened in the past? Did your spouse know about this? Did he or she consent? And what, what was the loan used for? But if it's on the other side, I want to do my due diligence as the, the lawyer or the practitioner. And we talk about discovery in, in the prior episode. So we want to make sure that we ask that question. Not only what are your debts, but really kind of spell it out. Are there any loans out there, promissory notes out there? Because usually my experience, you'll say you'll see that there's this, um, you know, alleged loan between a family member and the spouse, but it hasn't been memorialized. Mm -hmm. And it, the court's not going to enforce that unless the other side knew about it and consented and said, yeah, OK, well, this is a loan from this relative and we'll, we'll pay them back. But when that happens, in my experience, that's not even memorialized either in a text or an email. It's just verbal. And a lot of times spouses just forget <laughs> when, when asked about, oh, I don't remember saying that. And if there's nothing to show it, it it's hard to actually prove it. And so I always ask if there's promissory notes, mm -hmm. even with my own clients, I have them if they need help paying legal fees. That's fine. Your, your friend or relative or whomever can help. Well, let's memorialize that and make it an actual promise that you will pay back and, and specify what is that money to be used for. Because also you, you have these potentially open ended promise. You know, so it's so vague and ambiguous that the court isn't going to just tie it to, to the divorce. It mm -hmm. just happens. So oh, now we're going through divorce. And now I'm going to say that, you know, this promissory note was to be a marital debt when the true intention of it wasn't. And, and if it is, you know, contentious or ambiguous, I'll subpoena the other side and I say, okay, you were part of this promissory note. What was the intent? Mm -hmm. And then under oath, nine out of 10, they'll, they'll come forward. And usually I use that more as a mechanism to help facilitate settlement because the other side will know, okay, well, wait a second. I really don't want to go through all this. Let's, let's see what we can do to try to resolve it. But sometimes we have to take that extra step to make sure that, you know, Rebecca's talking about due diligence, that we're doing our due diligence, that we're protecting our clients and really not just moving the case forward, but setting the case up if we have to go to trial and then always look in bigger picture, even beyond the trial, if we have to preserve certain rights for appeal. Mm -hmm. So there's more to it than just, oh, there's debt out there, as you're talking about, because I agree with you. There's promissory notes in, and there's all these other loans that are out there that we just need to find out what they are, what's been memorialized and when it was acquired, because that's a huge thing, depending upon the jurisdiction you're in. Uh, I, I know in, in Missouri and Illinois, marital debt is usually any debt that's acquired from the day of the marriage until date of divorce. And of course, there's extenuating circumstances um, in between there. But in North Carolina, for example, once that date of separation is established, anything that's acquired after that could potentially be separate debt. So you may not be on the hook. It just depends on what that debt is tied to. If it's tied to something from the, the marriage, then it could be potentially presume marital debt, or you could buy that to be part marital, and part separate. But that's why you want to talk to a, a licensed attorney who really practices primarily in female, such as Malone Hatley, that we can properly advise you, this is what we need to do. Does it make sense to file for divorce now? Maybe it's just more fact gathering and just doing that. I, I call it pre-divorce analysis. We're not filing, we're not doing anything, but let's take a look to see what does your estate look like in what, what would that bigger picture potentially look like if we didn't move forward for filing for divorce or separation? Mm -hmm. and, and you brought up a really neat caveat that, you know, I know in Virginia, if you went and somebody loaned you during the divorce process, $10,000, let's say to pay for your attorney and is your parents saying, look, I'm going to help you out. And you didn't memorialize that in a promissory note, that'd be $10,000 of income to you, which could be divided during the equitable distribution. And so I always find that when, you know, you, you talk very clearly about you've got to be very careful when it's your client. But when it's the other side, we also want to look at that and say, we got this $10,000 influx. And I've seen a lot of practitioners and you just say, oh, it's for attorney's fees. And they just get, OK. And they don't say, well, where's the promise there? You know, um, you know you've got to ask that next question, even if it seems obvious uh, for the benefit of your client. So we, we talked about what positive assets are part of equitable distribution. We talked about what debts are part of equitable distribution. Rebecca, is there any property that can't be part of equitable distribution? So there's limitations if you have joint ownership on property. So if, if you have a husband and wife and maybe, you know, one of their parents um, also co-signed and is also on the title of the property, we may not be able to divide that in the divorce case. So when there's some someone else who's also on the title, 
that's going to have to be taken up in a separate lawsuit. Um, similarly, if you had like a business entity, maybe the, an, an LLC that it was husband, wife, and there was another partner or maybe multiple partners, we're not necessarily going to be able to divide that in the divorce setting because we don't have all the necessary parties, right? And so that lawsuit would have to be taken up separately. And hopefully it's something that could be just resolved. Um, but when you're talking about real estate, you may have to do a partition case um, mm -hmm. or you may have to do, um, you know, a, a, a like a warrant in debt or something like that um, outside of your divorce case to settle those outside obligations. Mm -hmm. uh, what about personal injury settlements? Personal injury settlements are tricky. And I had I've had this come up a couple times and it's just just so difficult to deal with. So let's say you have husband and wife husband during the marriage gets into a car accident and then gets, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar settlement. So it depends what that's for, because if it's, it's purely for injury, then that's his separate asset. And so long as he's deposited it in a separate account in only his name, it hasn't commingled with any other assets. He can trace that back out and show this is my separate, separate asset. Mm -hmm. If any portion of that settlement is for lost wages, then now that piece is arguably marital. And a lot of the time, personal injury settlements are not broken down all neat and clean to say, well, 50,000 of it is for your pain and suffering and 20,000 is for lost wages. And, you know, it, it, they're, they're not really line item broken down like that. It's just, will you settle the whole thing, including all of these claims for this one dollar figure? Um, and so that's where the, the convolution or the complexity comes in. If, if any amount of it is attributable to lost wages, then that's considered to be marital and that can be divided in the divorce. What if you have this personal injury settlement and I'll open up to both of y'all because I honestly don't know the answer. What if you have a personal injury settlement that is a, a combined amount of money and now your client is wanting to preserve their interest in that in the divorce. How do you go about proving what part was pain and suffering? Right. So you start with whatever documentation you have, whatever the settlement agreement was from the personal injury case. And if there's some kind of a breakdown in there somewhere, um, even just in the, the correspondence going back and forth, where we're asking for this much for pain and suffering, we're asking for this much for this, this much for that that may get you a handle on exactly what's going on. Um, but my understanding and my experience with personal injury settlements is a lot of the time it's just one kind of holistic dollar figure and you're gonna waive all of these claims, right? So that's inclusive of the property damage, the pain and suffering, the lost wages, the pain and suffering, everything is kind of lumped into this one dollar figure. Um, and there's probably not an easy way to trace back out exactly what's going on unless you have some sort of communication in the file about this is what we're asking for for this and this is what we're asking for for that. Um, and, and then that's what we're basing our entire, you know, lump sum settlement on. How about you, Dan? Yeah, you know, I wish they were broken down like jury instructions, but <laughs> nine out of 10, they're not. And it, and it depends if it's I look at it from two sides. If it's my client, then I want to get involved and talk to that attorney that's representing my client to make sure that we're protecting my client's right to the money. And what is the intent of that settlement? Is it to make my client whole? And if so, what does that mean? Because are we making them whole by pain and suffering and future medical expenses? Or are we making them whole because of lost wages as well? And then it's and it's establishing that a, a, um, not only the attorney-client privilege between my client, but also the work product privilege. And so having those discussions with that other side will allow us to have open and honest and frank discussions as far as what does that look like? Because we don't want to defraud the court. And that's not what we're talking about. We just want to make sure that we're protecting our, our client's interest in that settlement. Now, if it's on the other side, then... I want to know when did the accident happen and when was the lawsuit filed? And then also if, what are the settlement options that are out there? And, and I've had the experience where we have to file a motion to keep the, uh, that part of the record under seal or the entire case under seal, mm -hmm. which just means that no one else gets access to the file except by consent of the parties or order of the court. And then it's just going back to what we've been talking about and all of our podcasts is doing our due diligence and making sure that, we know exactly 
what potentially is out there. And then I, I want to know why this lawsuit was filed. And maybe there's a loss of consortium claim that my client can attach to that, which would then allow them even more potential money that they could be receiving. And so mm -hmm. it's just, it's, I agree with Rebecca, it can be very convoluted as far as what does that process look like. But at the end of the day, when we have personal injury lawsuits that are out there, we want to preserve our client's rights. And which also means maybe a lawsuit isn't filed there. So when you're going to trial or you're drafting a settlement, you preserve that right by preserving their interest and identifying if any lawsuit is filed that mm -hmm. my client isn't waiving their right to potential interest in any monies that the other side would receive. Because that side could that could be used to offset other debt that can be used as potential income. There's just so many issues that could arise from there that we want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to protect our client. And mm -hmm. then it goes into what we talked about in the prior episode with discovery and depositions and just asking the right questions to make sure that we get an understanding. What does that look like as far as what they're asking for too? Because if it is lost wages, we want to preserve that right. If it's for future medical expenses, then that's not going to be anything that uh, our client probably would be have a, a marital interest in. But it, again, it's just it's making mm -hmm. sure we're doing our due diligence. You know, another issue that we always want to look at in, in separate property is um, inheritances. And, you know, you have inheritances. You want to keep them separate. You have premarital houses that you want to do your best to keep separate. You have businesses, premarital businesses. You have premarital interest in retirement accounts. So now that we've identified what is not, what can't be part of equitable distribution, I think, Dan, that you brought it up quite frequently the next step is to ask the other side what they want. And that is such a missed step in equal distribution is to look at the other side and say, what do you want? Because it turns out they may want the same thing your client wants or, you know, just opposite. So it works. So what point in the process do you bring that up, Dan? It, it depends. And I feel like that's always the answer in, in these family law cases. It depends, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it, it does. And I take the point where, I, if the other side is represented, I'll reach out to the attorney and say, no, listen, send us a, a draft proposal. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't negate us doing our due diligence that we've been talking about in the prior episode in this episode, but it's at least to get that ball rolling and get that conversation going. We still want to make sure that we're knowing what assets and debts are out there, but I don't like to bid against myself. So mm -hmm. I always want the other side to make that proposal first, because maybe it's something that we were going to do, you know, we've been talking about equity and fair. Maybe we were going to do 50, 50, but other sides, you know, I just went out and I see this all the time. You can have X, Y, and Z, just sign the documents and on its face, it looks too good to be true, but sometimes it, someone just wants out of the marriage. Mm -hmm. So if the other side is in agreement, I don't want my client to give up more than he or she really needs to. So I like the other side to at least start that. And then it gives me an idea of where their mindset is too. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be a case that's litigious or is this going to be something that we might really be able to resolve by settlement? And then of course the, the magic question from the client is when, and mm -hmm. it, it depends on how that settlement is drafted. Is this something that's just so unreasonable that is okay. They just did it just to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's to tell the judge we're trying to, to move this case forward? Or are they really coming to the table in good faith that we can invest some time and maybe dial back some of the discovery or the depositions that we need to take? And how about you, Rebecca? When, when is your favorite time to start the settlement process? So I usually ask my client, you know, how much have the two of you talked about this? Mm -hmm. How, how much of a conversation has there been around, you know, if we do get a divorce, this is what I want to happen or this is what should happen. Um, sometimes they've had that conversation and they're both on the same page that, well, he agreed he'd be responsible for this. I agree that I want that. He wants the house. I want this. You know, they've had these all detailed out conversations. And then I help them go through the math and make sure that what they're agreeing to is fair and reasonable based on all of their circumstances, because they might think their their conversations have been completely fair and, oh, yeah, he said he's going to take on this debt, but he's also getting all the assets and, mm -hmm. you know, what, and it's not fair whatsoever. So we go through the math. We make sure that bottom line, it looks reasonable. It looks fair. And then, OK, we we already know that you've had the conversation. We already know he's willing to agree to this. It looks like it's fair. We have to do some of our due diligence. But this is what we can go ahead and propose. I don't I disagree with Dan. I don't like waiting for the other side to write their first offer 
Because while I do agree with not wanting to bid against myself, I don't like being in a holding pattern for forever. And I find that a lot of attorneys are really slow and I don't want to wait six months and be calling their office like, hey, you said you'd send me an offer. I still don't have anything. And my client's like, hey, I thought we were doing something. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. So just for that reason, I like to be the first one to say, let me go ahead and write this up because I know I'm going to have it done in two days. I don't need to wait six months and drag this out any further than it needs to go. Um, but that's usually the initial conversation. Now, if I have the conversation with the client and they say they're going to fight everything tooth and nail, they hate me, they, you know, they want everything, they want to give me nothing. Well, do we really need to waste a lot of time trying to write up this really fair, reasonable offer if I know that they're just going to say no? Probably not. Let's let's redirect and let's go ahead towards filing the divorce then um, and move it forward. If they say, I really don't know, like we never talked about divorce. We just kind of haven't talked to each other in 10 years. Well, maybe we reach out to the other side and say, we're looking you know, to, to try and resolve this. And what is it that you're looking for? Or what do you think would be fair? And at least kind of probe and see what what that looks like. Um, but it's it's going to depend on what that internal sort of conversation has been for the client in terms of how we're going to react. It is. And, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll probably disagree with you, Rebecca. I like the, the first send <laughs> of the settlement agreement because I usually follow it up. You have 21 days to respond before I take my next step. Right. Yeah. You know, I can put a deadline on there. And mm -hmm. in the past, you know, I've had attorneys. I believe the attorneys were stonewalled because, you know, Dan and you both have really talked about talk to your client. Listen to your client. Your client may still be in contact, a lot of contact with their soon to be ex spouse. And I had one saying, like, my wife didn't get the settlement agreement. And you didn't, and the, the client was blaming me at that point. You didn't send a settlement agreement because my wife didn't get it. And I'm like, well, here's the day I sent it to you that I said I sent it. Here's the fax receipt. Here's the mail receipt. Here's the email where I sent it to the other side. And here's where I copied you on all this. And the client's like, okay. And in that situation, I actually called a deposition and I deposed the other side of my settlement agreement and said, would you agree to this? Would you agree to that? Would you agree to this? And the attorney was irate and beside themselves claiming that what I was doing was wrong. And in the deposition, we proved that the attorney had actually sent the separation agreement to the client. Um, so we got a, a very sizable award of attorney's fees. And, and that's why I like, you know, you use a settlement agreement to hear what the other side wants to say. But you also can use it as you know, a prophylactic measure, when, even when you know the other side's not going to agree to anything. You send something over and say, look, we're trying in our best, best faith here. Let's split it 50-50 at least. You know, at least 50-50, what we know is going to be split. Um, you know, equitable distribution is something that we could talk about for a long time because really we just got to the point of the, the, one of the steps of you know, finding out what the other side wants. We haven't even gotten to the actual litigation stage. So, you know, please join us next time for part three of equal distribution, where we're gonna sit down and talk about what comes next. You know, if the other side won't agree, even if we know what the other side wants, what happens now? So I wanna thank you for taking the time to join us today, Dan and Rebecca. And as always, if you or someone you know is going through a divorce, have them contact Mullen Hatley PC. See the difference that a partner can make. Somebody that's actually gonna sit down and listen to you. And somebody's gonna explain everything to you in plain English can make for you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.